Uh, and you have the okay. link to the new stream I can send out? I did. I tweeted it out uh, so you can just find my Twitter, but I can also just send it to you from there again. Yeah, I'll just find your Twitter. Okay. It's on the internet. It is on the internet. <laughs> I know where you so are. It's so easy to search. The internet. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, welcome back. Um, for the last session of XEG, um, there will be demos after that, so don't go away. But for the last session of uh, talks, we're covering platformers. And so we decided instead of trying to lump by some technical aspect or loose, um, meaningless category, we actually have one meaningful category. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jonathan's going to open up with using mu music theory to analyze platformers, and we'll kind of roll from there. Cool. Hi. Um, so I'm Jonathan. I'm from the Augmented Design Lab at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and this is my Mario paper. So I'm one of three out of all the papers I need to have published to be a games researcher. Um, but so uh, Mario levels are, are things that exist. And I think we're all very familiar with sort of properties and uh, other sorts of you know, parts of them. But the thing that interests me and thing that I feel is important is that they're discrete, right? Um, these, you know, there are different sorts of chunks, and each of them sort of do different things within the level. So uh, we can sort of break them apart um, and kind of look at just one segment at a time if we had, you know, a good principled way to go about doing this. I propose using music theory to try to get to try to get at this. Mainly, uh, I'm looking at a bottom-up approach that sort of breaks it down further and further until you get sort of these axiomatic uh, categories, and then you recompose sort of high-level um, bits of level from these tiny little uh, chunks. So um, this is not sort of the first time music ideas have been used in platformers. Um, there is you know, a lot. There's a strong history of uh, the idea of the beat inside of a platformer, right? From uh, Kate Compton's 2008 work, which is where those platformers, or 2006, I'm sorry, uh, work, which is where those platforms come from, which is a sort of level generator derived from an idea of beat, to Gillian Smith's analysis and also generation work, which also uses an idea of beat. Uh, you know, we've decided that platformers and at least this concept of beat are highly entwined. Uh, and that stuff works. It works well, right? Uh, so why would you ever want to go and push this forward? Um, that being said, this idea is basically a gameplay beat is a single action a player takes. So like jump a gap, stop a foe, dodge an attack. Um, and then we can kind of use that to build levels or analyze levels. But I'm a musician. Uh, I, this is a picture of me from a long time ago when I had shorter and less colorful hair. Um, and so I've always kind of wondered what happens if we go deeper. Can we actually fully, you know, bring an entire music theory to bear on games? And so uh, I'm going to start by talking about uh, musical beat versus this concept of gameplay beat. Then I'm going to introduce uh, Gestalt music theory, which is a way to analyze music. Um, it actually also has an interesting analog into games in the gameplay Gestalt. Um, then I'm going to talk about two attempts at this. One of them I gave a talk at, uh, which was Rogue, at Gameslit last year. So the paper focuses on Mario, and that's what I'm going to focus on in this talk. But I will introduce Rogue. Rogue. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some future work. So um, beat. Uh, music has this other thing called meter. And that's really just sort of this important number here, uh, as soon as my slides transition, um, which is sort of this idea that there is going to be a, a regular repeating beat through a chunk of music. And as one of the uh, fallout from this, some of the fallout, uh, we get sort of a regular repetition um, of stressed and unstressed beats. And so unless you very intentionally break this stressed, unstressed pattern, we call that syncopation, um, this is how uh, music's going to flow. It's why you naturally clap on one and three, and why all your musician friends get very mad at you when you clap on one and three. Um, but games don't have meter. Unless they're endless runners, which probably have meter because they're have forced movement through a you know particular setup, but uh, most games don't have meter. Um, so this idea of weak and strong beats don't really make sense. So we're going to have to try to look at a music theory that doesn't have a built-in stress pattern, unlike sort of common practice theory, which is where sort of meter and time come from. Um, and Gestalt theory groups musical ideas together uh, through time, independent of meter. It doesn't care what sort of the metrical part of the piece is. And that's why it's useful. So how do we apply this? What is, what is a Gestalt theory? Right? How do we do it? Um, so we'll keep track of several, mu several musical properties, and we'll treat them as continuous variables. Uh, when we see a new event that's very different from all the events that have come before it, we'll start a new grouping. We'll say, OK, that stuff before is separate from the stuff that we're in now. There's been some like, big event that's changed how we're going to move forward through time. Um, and then these Gestalts are just groupings. And we can compose these hierarchically. So we can take a bunch of small Gestalts that we figured out, smash them together, and call them a slightly like, higher level or um, larger gestalt. And we can do this all the way out to where we just have one giant gestalt that's the entire piece of music. 
Um, that's the basis of Schenkerian analysis, but uh, I didn't go that far in this particular work. So let's actually talk about applying this. Um, and so uh, the thing I want to look at, this musical property that I want to look at for this particular piece, and this is Beethoven's fifth, the introduction. Um, you know it, even if you don't know you know it. It's bum 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 right? Um, and so I want to track sort of note onset. Um, so when we hear a new note uh, come into play, and we're going to keep track of this value, um, and then you know try to draw lines and break us apart based off of that. Uh, so my little pink uh, diagram here, since I didn't want to go over how to read sheet music, uh, kind of sort of shows that. Um, so we're musicians in this example, so we're going to start with one. Um, so the first note is you know the first thing we hear. Uh, and then the next note comes one simple time step after that, because we're breaking on the eighth note. Um, and we can kind of keep going all the way till we get to this note here, which is different, right? Because the last thing we heard was five eighth notes since this one. Um, and that's really different from everything else in front of it, so let's draw a line. Uh, and then uh, we want to keep, we can keep going forward till we get to the next point that's different and also draw a line there. And these then become sort of separate segments in, this, in our analysis. Um, and we can also finish that just for fun. And this actually like works. Um, you can see that uh, these two sorts of initial groupings are different from the back grouping. It's essentially the beginning of a motive. Um, we're introducing a theme, and then we're elaborating on that theme in the stuff that I've highlighted in yellow. So my first pass at this was like, all right, well, let's try to characterize PCG generators with gestalts. Uh, and this is a talk I gave at Gameslit, um, so I'm not going to reprise very much of it here. But essentially, I uh, found an old version of Rogue. Um, then found its level generation code, rewrote that code in Python, and then um, had it generate a bunch of levels and track the various parameters through them. And so the one that I have shown is trap distributions. So uh, we can see that there is you know, an entire different star at, what is that, level 7 of the dungeon, 8, um, where the players encounter their first trap. Nothing is the same anymore. Oh my god, this game has traps. God damn it. Um, and then later on, uh, we can see as player you know encounters two traps, and then there's some noise. But then there's going to come a point where a player is never going to encounter one trap again, assuming they find the amulet on floor 25, and also not rewinding them back up through the dungeon. Um, and so that's neat. Um, you can actually do this really cool thing that I don't want to show here because again I'd be reprising more work, where you can actually say, okay, through many repeats of Rogue, if I look at averages, uh, I, all these sorts of noisy things that have gestalts become lines, and so you can actually watch PCG get boring as you get less and less gestalts, and everything kind of melds to one. So that's neat. Um, and also, uh, what I didn't talk about right now is that you need a way to combine several level features, because it turns out rogue maps are not just numbers of traps. Um, but we need a stricter methodology, right? This was kind of applied ad hoc in a sort of music theory way, not a very you know, strict computer science way. And if we want to actually use this for other stuff, we're going to need to find a really good way to go about it. And finally, uh, there's no uh, guarantee that a player is going to interact with anything in rogue. Right? Um, we need to consider what the player is doing in the player's actions if we want to actually make this work. So um, moving forward, a gameplay gestalt, which I got from uh, Lindley in 2002, who's writing about ludonarrative dissonance, uh, he defines this as a, play a pattern of interaction that a player adopts to bring about success. Um, so essentially, players perform gestalts through games in order to achieve goals. And these also break down hierarchically. So a single action like jumping a gap or dodging a bullet gets combined with nearby actions to form a slightly larger, higher level gestalt. And those you know, form a higher level gestalt still until we have sort of a full player run through. Sounds a lot like a play trace. Uh, so let's look at play traces. And now you know why I did Mario. Um, so I found a, a data set of play traces that have enough information to pull this off in the platformer experience data set, which was never meant for this. Um, and this is a data set of play traces from the Infinite Mario Brothers. Uh, generator, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But if you're not, it's essentially a framework for generating Mario levels. Um, and it also comes with a bunch of video, and I didn't look at any of the video. So you know, there's nothing like opening up your data set and realizing that you're throwing out like gigabytes and gigabytes of data, because it's not what you want. And then the next thing I kind of worked on was a viz to kind of you know, deal with these individual traces in a way that I wanted to look at them. And so this is a very thing that's very reminiscent of mini tracks. Um, and I want to kind of go into this in some detail. Uh, in order to understand it, because it's a bit a lot. It's a bit of a lot to look at if you're not familiar with trackers. So at the bottom here is the full level. This is everything that we see. Um, each of these tracks is an individual set of states that players can move through, uh, starting with direction on the top, which essentially Mario is either still or moving left or moving to the right. Uh, the power up state is just if Mario is little, big, or on fire. 
Um, ground actions are things like running or crouching. Um, jumping is jumping, if Mario is airborne or not. Uh, and then the ped also tracks things like slaying when Mario has killed an enemy, and unleashing when a new enemy gets spawned. But um, it doesn't track it particularly well, and those were really noisy, so I had to not use them for analysis. The top here is just a window on the bottom. So I can slide this blue window around and resize it to get a zoomed in view to do, you know, to look at this more in particular. And I started by, again, uh, well, so, sorry. The problem here is that uh, if you remember from our Beethoven example a couple of slides ago, there was only one melodic line going on at a time. And that was great. Um, this technique comes from uh, Tenny and Polanski in 1980 to analyze a bunch of solo monophonic flute music. Monophonic just meaning one voice at a time. Um, and so you only have one line of music. But here we've got a lot, you know, we've got essentially a, a idea of music polyphony. There are several things happening at once. A lot of states are being changed. And so uh, we need some way to collapse this into a monophonic concept in order to actually apply this analysis. So we can do that because we can look at superstate. Um, this is a very similar viz with the same sort of interaction paradigm, but instead the top track here is just when Mario is in one state, and Mario is always in some sort of state, right, because he always has power up. Um, the bottom, the next track is when Mario is in two states. It's usually moving, but sometimes it's jumping, sometimes it's just crouching. Uh, the next is in when Mario is in three simultaneous states. Uh, and uh, this actually resizes, so if there is a time or a level where Mario is in four states, which occasionally happens, sometimes he's running, jumping, uh, has a power up state, and like, has a direction, um, then we can sort of expand and add a fourth track there too. So that's the like state paradigm, right? The things that Mario is jumping and running through. Uh, what are the things that we're going to track in order to tell us when to draw a new line? What's our sort of here? Remember, it was note distance or onset time distance. What are we going to do? And so uh, I came up with a rough metric of state distance. So we're basically just calculating a distance between states. If the distance ever gets greater than our running average, then we're going to start a new gestalt. And this is going to be a linear combination of uh, several things, because it's different to have Mario sort of go from small to big than it is from uh, moving left to right. But at the start, I didn't weight anything. Uh, and at the start of a new gestalt, reset the average, right? Go back to zero, and then say, this is a new, a new paradigm we're under. Let's go until we break it again. And so uh, this works, kind of. Um, we're going to go into some problems here. But uh, very successfully, we see, or I'm trying to show that in the back here, each color is its own separate gestalt drawn. Uh, and the purple lines are boundaries. Um, we get something that's very similar to the mode of repetition that gestalt you know, analysis is good at finding in Beethoven with Mario and jumping. Here's sort of a, a repeated jump, extended jumping pattern where Mario is kind of uh, on the ground very briefly and then jumping for a long time and not moving. Uh, could be enemy dodging. Um, Head doesn't really give you that information, so it's hard to say. But uh, we did find something that looks like a repeated motive. Um, and the problem with using an unweighted system here is stuff like this, where uh, this all looks like it probably should be under one gestalt. Um, it's a, you know, a period where Mario's moving a lot. Um, and in sort of a lot of, uh, there's a lot of jumping that's happening here. It feels like it's one concrete idea, but uh, this is, or you know, the system, I guess, in a very lightweight version of the system, considering it's a couple lines of Python, um, has decided to break it apart. And so uh, that's not quite what we want, because each of these things aren't as important as other things, right? Um, so if I then try to say, OK, well, let's weight these such that state changes that are very important have more uh, weight. Therefore, their distances are bigger. So Mario becoming, you know, going from small to big is a huge move. Um, and we pr should probably draw a gestalt boundary whenever that happens versus uh, Mario making a bunch of floor, a small flurry of jumps is less important, and maybe we shouldn't move, you know, we shouldn't draw a new boundary there. Um, so doing weights, you can remove this. And this is sort of a weight distribution that I more or less kind of found by hand. Um, I was, I played, you know, human-tuned weight distribution. Um, but even then, this doesn't, like, completely work out. There's still a lot of problems here, uh, mainly that all of this is a single gestalt. Uh, and that also feels unsatisfying because there's just, you know, this long period where Mario is just under, you know, small, there's a pause at the end of it. Um, and there's also this, you know, flurry of action that's happening in the middle. And that also does not feel like it should be under the same gestalt. So where to go from here? Um, clearly we need to combine player actions with level geometry. Uh, just going with level geometry means that we don't understand what a player is currently doing or perceiving. Just going with player actions means that we can't derive any sort of reasoning 
for why a player is doing stuff. And that's really important. Uh, Mario who's just jumping in place to jump in place is a different Mario than Mario who's jumping to dodge enemies. Those are different gestalts and different ideas. Uh, that being said, I'm way too lazy to do data collection. So if somebody has a really good data set with player actions, level geometry, and some have been brought to my attention, um, I'd love to look at them. Uh, finding higher level gestalts. So right now we've only kind of been, or I've only sort of found these low level collections, but we still need to compose them into higher level gestalts, and that's what's interesting and useful. Um, it's kind of tricky to see how to do that. In music, there's a lot of just looking at sort of the averages that are present, uh, and maybe those work here, but uh, I'd lie to say that I've, if I've done it yet. There's also a question of validity. Uh, so you found these gestalts and you claim that they actually help us do something, but uh, do they actually map to any real world sort of concepts or useful things? Uh, it's a little, oop, that's a little too fast. Um, beating me to my own slides, there's a different gestalt. This presentation is different now. Um, so there's some question of how does this map out in the real world? Does this ground out well in music? The general way this is done is through argumentation because it's a humanities discourse, but I'd like to find a more, uh, a way to kind of hack, hack at it in a more computer science way because that's where I'm, you know, mostly, uh, that's mostly my home discipline. This music theory stuff's mostly for fun. Um, I think there are way better domains than platformers, and I don't mean that just because I never wanted to do a platformer paper and then suddenly found myself doing a platformer paper. Um, platformers themselves have very obvious boundaries based off of just looking at them, right? You can look at sort of the sprites and the interactions just be like, okay, so like, this is different from the time Mario has gone underground. That's very obviously different when Mario coming above ground. Those are obvious gestalt lines. Uh, why do we need a technique to find that for us? We can just tell. Um, but I think that domains that have fuzzy lines are a way better way to look at this. So things like esports. I'm going to use League of Legends as my example um, because I've played a little bit of League. Um, they have these fuzzy ideas of a mid, of an early game, a mid game, and a late game. And it would be really awesome to have an analysis technique that would let us break apart to where the early game is happening, where the mid game is happening, where the late game is happening. And that's kind of similar to trying to figure out when a piece of music is under development or not. Uh, and so uh, I think maybe with a little bit of refinement, um, this might be useful for looking at that sort of thing. And also Riot has a pretty good API, it looks like, for coming out with data, so it's not too hard to find data, um, which is great. But I think the most important thing out of all of this is to actually see if gestalts play nice in sandboxes with other things. Alone by itself, uh, gestalt analysis is neat and cool, but I don't think it's doesn't I don't think it explains a whole lot that's particularly useful. But it does segment out play traces in a way that where you can kind of say, okay, this is different from the things around it. And if you can, you know, do some sort of averaging, which you need to do anyway to come up with these higher level gestalts, you can say, okay. Not only is this A section different from the B and C sections next to it, but it's similar to an A section later. And then you can use that as sort of a way to have already sort of pre-tagged data to plug into whatever you're doing next, whether that's machine learning or bearing another statistical analysis technique or something further. So um, that's my talk. I'm a little fast. I apologize. Thank you very much for your time, and I can take questions. I thought I saw him. Yeah. Um, was the the code that you wrote to find the results? Yeah. In the Mario theme. Did you try running them on the music to see if it would match and huh. determine the results to kind of give you an idea of how well it's working? No. Um, especially towards the end, I kind of wonder if it would work super well because you need to come up with weights to do the sort of you know figuring out what's important and what's not. Well, music also has stuff where it'll go off sure. the Sure. Um, and yeah, and a good gestalt analysis will find that, right? Um, we'll find points where you're like, oh, what, you know, you have this like really fluffy, fluttery, you know, flute BS, which was mostly what I performed. Um, you know, there is clearly some underlying structure here. We can segment all this out, right? A run itself is, the notes in a run isn't important. It's the direction of the run that matters. And uh, again, I think it would be cool if I could do like something so general that you could plug both music and games into, but there was a lot of very game-specific stuff that I had to do to get this to work. Defining the distance function, for example, makes no sense in music. Um, or it does make sense, but you would need to have an entirely different data source below it. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, it's the weighting, too, that I feel uh, like different parts of the function were weighted different ways, so you could probably plug in a new weighting and make it work, but you'd have to have a plug-and-play weighting system, and I don't have that right now. Yeah, Adam? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Hi. Now, uh, do you think it would be worthwhile 
to try, I don't know, um, so maybe not the Gestalt analysis, or maybe, uh, but like, use like some sort of like more supervised method of like have a person go through and be like, ah, like this section of player, like, you know, if you had mm -hmm. to like watch it, be like, well, this is like one sort of cohesive unit, this is another, yeah. and then like try to predict based off of like the Gestalt stuff, be like, oh, I see that like, even like, you know, not just from the Gestalt stuff, but like, oh, I predict that this probably thing kind of thing is happening, or yeah. in a I, while, or. Maybe, I feel like that stuff's already out, right? I, I can't, I didn't do, I'm not super familiar with like games research, uh, but I want to say that there's got to be a paper that has people tagging different parts of levels and then doing like machine learning to learn the tag set on an arbitrary chunk of level. I don't think so. Oh. I could be. Well, uh, doing a bad job by Julian's the waving his hand around. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, if nobody's done it, then uh, yes, definitely. If somebody has done it and they have that data, I love it. Um, just to compare and contrast, because that would be a really cool thing to look at. Yeah, Julian. Hey. Um, of course, I came in late, so I didn't have the time to do it. I think um, the people that were here at the start are also a little hazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 how is it different from just doing um, basically sequence analysis, like sequence mining? Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah. yeah, I think it, it's a it's a type of sequence analysis. Um, and it's probably closer to, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a sequence analysis technique that I got from music rather than from computer science. Um, I would say that uh, sequence analysis is probably strictly better in almost every case. Um, but, you know, uh, this was fun to work on, and it's a different perspective. So, so, so we did some sequence analysis. Mm -hmm. Basically using spade and the standard sequence mining techniques. So you get, like, basically commonly recurring sub-sequences. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that's going to be from music and what they, what they say they're getting at is themes. Yes, and, that's, and that's exactly what Gestalt analysis is supposed to yeah, recover. Yeah. They're very similar. Yeah, and, and our thinking this was basically that these correspond to the sound patterns. Oh. Um, but a very low level of the sound mm -hmm. patterns. So basically, the sound patterns are like, you know, all over the place in terms of where they are and hierarchically. But I mean, if you look at those types of sound patterns, um, uh, so like the ones we see in those schools we got from the modern levels. Mm -hmm. um, these are sort of things we find with just using sequence mining as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to interview a few things. So okay. I think we probably do it in a quite different place. So I'm trying to I understand it from the actual paper. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's 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 very, very similar to sequence analysis. Um, and it's one of those things where I kind of like stumbled in and was like, oh, well. <laughs> It's uh, but yeah, it's a lot of trying to find the same thing because there seems to be this underlying concept that's similar in both games and music, of this these rep these repeated ideas throughout a level. Oh, um, and we don't call it a level of music; we call it a piece of music. But it feels like a level when you're performing it. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a lot of just people coming to the same conclusion. And I think the sequence analysis techniques are more well developed than coming at it from the single. Maybe, but um, one one thing was sort of related to was the thing that. I you need to find some more abstract things. So the basic sequence mining gets you like, um, here's, here's a sequence of things that literally occur. Yeah. Now, but you want to find something slightly more abstract, or like basically, so in the design patterns that we did, um, that to me or rather Steve mm -hmm. found by hand, it was basically something, here's a high valley, and here's this kind of thing. So yeah. Super cross levels. But then he had to code this the detectors by hand because I mean, they were. Um, you need to to have up like a pipe that you have to mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So, right. It should probably be we should we need to find this and again ideally we want to find something which sort of incurs a regular language mm -hmm. of these patterns. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Um and in the sequence analysis stuff, were you looking at traces or were you just looking at levels? Actually, no. Maybe we should go offline. We should talk about this offline. I need to. I need to get out. Of, I need to get off of this podium and let other people talk. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, yes. I was just wondering. Um, it seems like your analysis of is uh, player playthroughs. Yes. Right? And it seems like that's more of a performance rather than an analysis of a performance rather than an analysis of the level itself. Yes. Have you done any have you considered Analyzing different player, like players with different skill levels and their playthroughs and comparing the two. No, um, I think. Well, I think I could do that with Ted because I think there was a uh, a questionnaire at the end that had a player rate their familiarity with Mario, which I guess you could use as a proxy for skill level, but it's not a good one. 
Um, no, I haven't because I haven't done any data collection myself, uh, and honestly, uh, I don't plan on it. But um, I think that would be really cool to look at sort of different um, ways that players go through levels and see if that correlates to um, skill and also uh, how their gestalt are different. So maybe everybody stops at one point regardless of skill level and has to spend a second being all like, okay, now I'm in a new level. And that would be interesting to see um, as well as where things are different, right? Where do uh, we know that novices probably stop more than people who are really good at platformers do, but um, if novices are all stopping in the same spot, that's interesting to talk about. If um, where sort of like player pros keep going and novices stop is also interesting to see and kind of how their gestalt's different because uh, for a novice, um, for, well, I'm sorry, for a gestalt composition, uh, one of the things that I didn't like focus on in the paper or the presentation, I talked a little bit about it in the paper, is that uh, the way they compose, they compose on boundaries. So a single boundary of a high level gestalt is traceable all the way down to a low level action um, because of how they compose. And so it would be cool to kind of see like where sort of high level players um, gestalts go and how they overlap with the level players, but I haven't looked at that yet. All right, well, I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you very much. So now we have Adam coming back for what number three, four, nine, uh, fifty, four, four times up here, four, four times this year. At least this isn't back to back this year. Like I kind of feel like. Yes. Oh, I mean, technically, I did have time. back to back, but it was just QA was back. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's <laughs> you know it's yeah, a staggered power hour. Like, you did not get the Adam Central Power Hour. Yes. Yes. So. Next year we can fix that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but going on from uh, looking yeah. at platformers using sort of gestalt analysis, we're going to instead uh, have people perform for machines and use that data. You like that tieback? Very good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a so, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, using sort of machine learning techniques to analyze uh, players playing uh, from their gameplay video, which is actually an extension of work from last year, right? Uh, this is so not an ex this is an extension of work from well, okay. well uh, Matthew's last year though. This is yes. This is a you got your chocolate and my peanut butter, Peter and butter and my chocolate. Okay, two great tastes okay. straight okay. together. Um, yeah, great, <laughs> great tasting, great talk. Let's see it. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Somerville again, um, and today uh, along with this Matthew Gustile here, uh, this yeah, Matthew Gustile, not any of the other ones. Uh, going to be discussing uh, learning player tale of content from observation, uh, platformer level generation from uh, video traces, using long short term memory for members. Okay, uh, Mario PCG work. Everybody's done it. Everybody will continue to do it forever until we're all sick of it. Um, <laughs> you know, there's the uh, you know the classical AI approaches uh, that. You know, use classical AI like constraint solving, and then you know more recently, there's been the the push for the statistical AI of you know either like learning from uh, the ingrams or uh, Nor's work with matrix factorization or Matthew's other work. Um, so this comes as an extension of some of my work, uh, which so this is the result of some of the work that I presented earlier this year at uh, FDIGRA. Uh, which was, you know, taking Mario levels uh, and putting them through a an LSTM, making them a sequence. Uh, what I, you know, did a tutorial on yesterday, uh, and some of the things that I learned from that, uh, and then trying to extend it. So, the impetus was, uh, I put, you know, I tried many different ways of uh, spinning the level, putting the levels into the level gen or the machine learning process. Uh, the simplest one, which is the result, is shown here at the top. Uh, was which is really it's ugly. Anyway, um, was that you know the levels come in and it's just the course level geometry as it's found in Super Mario Brothers, um, and it generates okayish things. It's maybe not the best. This was just a randomly selected snippet that I just hit a button on this morning, um, and then uh, you know at the bottom is the result from the the best level generator. Uh, which I'll go through what, exactly what it was uh, doing. Uh, but one of the key things that you can see is that it incorporates Mario's path through it. Uh, and this is not like after the fact running Mario through it. 
this is the level generator as it's generating. It believes that this is a good exemplar path of Mario through the level as it's generating. Um, and so what I sort of found was that by including this path, uh, it you know, sort of biased the level generator. Even though it's learning from the same course level geometry structure, it actually changed what it was generating and caused it to produce better levels. Um, and so in conjunction with Matthew's work, it was, you know, he's been actually working from real players. This was a you know, completely fake simulated tile level A star player. Uh, you know, so the idea was if an A star player can change it, how do actually incorporating human playthroughs, will it bias the level gener generator in interesting ways uh, to tailor the content to uh, based off of that video playthrough? Right, so yes, adding pass changed it. Would uh, players bias their content uh, to their play style? Uh, so first, going to discuss uh, the work that this is based off of, the LSTM Mario level generation. And then Matthew is going to discuss the video trace collection. Uh, and then we'll go through the results. One of a comparison case study of two of the videos. Uh, and then finally, just sort of a summary of all the results. OK, um, so there's a number of things. There's the vocabulary that we're using. Uh, the vocabulary that uh, we use in this has 13 uh, things. You know, it can be an enemy, a uh, breakable block, block, question mark block that just contains a coin, question mark block that contains some sort of power up, full bill stuff, coins, and then the pieces of a pipe. Uh, so that's you know the building blocks that we're going to be basing off of. You know, obviously there are things missing from this like uh, springs and moving platforms. Uh, you know, it's future work that we'd like to get to, um, and so this is a slightly uh, simplified, abstracted version, but. Uh, this is what we're going to be using going forward. Uh, so right, to uh, be able to generate them as uh, uh, generate Mario levels, uh, Mario is a 2D grid, uh, and the LSTM works on a single one-dimensional sequence. Uh, so the question is, how do we make a 2D thing into a 1D sequence? Uh, and there's a couple of different ways. There's what I would call the naive row, where we just you know raster across. Um, but this has the unfortunate thing that it requires you know, more than 200 uh, time steps, since most Mario levels are 200 plus tiles wide, uh, to remember the next thing down in like, a, like the next row, uh, which is a pretty long time frame for a lot of, uh, for an LSTM, even though they're very good at remembering across uh, long time frames. Uh, you know, so we believe that this would not produce a good result. Uh, and then there's the uh, naive column, which, you know, Brasters, uh, top to bottom or bottom to top, uh, pick which way you want to do that. And you know, one tile to the past is always, you know, one tile to the left is always 16 in the past. And then finally, uh, the snaking, which uh, you know, zips back and forth and uh, runs through the level twice. Uh, one so that it starts at the top left corner and zigzags that way, and then one that it starts at the bottom left corner and zigzags the other way. And uh, that's what we're going to be using for this. Uh, that's what I found in my previous work. Uh, to have the best result, you can read that paper if you'd like. So another uh, sort of uh, facet of the data that I sort of added to help uh, the generator uh, is what I would call depth information, which is that you know as you're going through a Mario level, uh, we tend to like there tends to be some sort of flow and ebb and flow through the level uh, that we think maybe is important structure to to carry across. You know at the beginning of the level, it's pretty low intensity. The player's just starting out. You don't just start them right in the thick of things, there's some sort of building up, and then we move up to the medium intensity, and then you know there's like a cool down period, and then we finally have the end where there's like the, the pyramid and the flag. And so you know different portions of the level have uh, different characteristics. Uh, so we wanted some way to sort of encode this so that that would be uh, available for the generator. And uh, the way that this is done is that every 10 columns into the level, uh, there's sort of a meta symbol that says like you are you know, for the first 10, zero deep into the level. For the, you know, next, for 10 to 20, you're, you know, one deep. For, you know, 30 to 40, or 20 to 30, you're two, et cetera, um, to sort of help the bias to generate. This, again, was found to have the best results for the, uh, the previous work. OK, so uh, probably sick of me explaining what a neural network is to you, and apologize for that. But uh, in case you're, you're new to this, uh, I'll do it again. So again, uh, we have our vocabulary, uh, and this is again a one-hot encoding. So you know, this would say that there was a uh, question mark block that had just a coin in it, and nothing else, uh, 
we run through a neural network, and we want to get out what is the, what is the probability of uh, what the next thing is. Um, you know, and this is uh, just a standard uh, feed forward uh, neural network. Uh, and you know, we're doing a sequence. We think that as we're going through, you know, the pattern that it's going to come across is going to carry important information. Uh, so we want these recurrent edges so that you, know, you might find a question mark block here. And the next time it comes through, uh, these probabilities might be you know, different, despite the fact that it's the same information coming in based on the, uh, the sequence that's been coming in. But recurrent neural, neural networks have the problem of only remembering a, a very short number of time steps in the past, uh, you know, somewhere between like about like five to six as uh, the, the maximum. And you know, we're considering just from one column to the next, six would get you, you know, halfway through a column there, you know, like which is not terribly good. Uh, so we use the long short-term memory, which is you know, a variant of the recurrent neural network, uh, where the recurrent edge has this forget gate which is the rate that it'll uh, forget at, and then has this uh, nice uh, the summation where it's adding this uh, recurrent portion back in, as opposed to multiplying it, uh, which solves the, uh, the uh, ex vanishing gradient problem, where if you are multiplying it, you know, as you consider further back in time, you're raising this number to a power, the number is clamped between zero and one, that's going to shrink to zero. So, uh, the LSTM RNN is the variant where instead of just a single node there, we now have this LSTM cell, uh, and it's going to you know, hopefully produce uh, the best results. Um, so now I will hand it over to Matthew. Thank you. I'm that Matthew Gosdile. Pleased to meet you, everyone. Uh, all right, so video trace collection. We have this cool generator thing. How are we going to get some data for it? Am I clicking the right thing? I, I don't know. I just use the mouse wheel. Oh. Okay. I'm clicking those things, I don't know. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so uh, at a high level, what we're interested in is given that we have a map of what a level looks like and we have some video data, we'd love to be able to get this thing where we have the player actually moving through the level map. Uh, so sort of express down the player's path onto this level map to be able to use in the generator we just talked about. Uh, that's not as super trivial as it may seem, so let's talk about how we do this thing. Uh, so what we do is we have this sprite sheet over here on the left. This has essentially every image that can possibly show up in Super Mario Brothers. And what we do is we parse uh, both of every single frame of our video and the entirety of our map with OpenCV and this sprite sheet. So OpenCV tells us, okay, so this element of the sprite sheet is located here in this image, whether that image is a frame or a map. And that allows us to squish both of these things down into the same representation, which you see here on the far right. And when we do that, now we can compare between these two representations. Oop. Don't go too far. OK, move on too far. OK, so now that we have a map here on the top left, and we have a frame over here on the right, if we have them both in the same representation, now we can say, all right, given uh, our map, we could think of this map as being represented of several different possible frames. Each one down here on the bottom is in a slightly different sort of slice uh, of this map, representing a different possible frame that we could be in in terms of the video frame. Uh, you can, it's not super obvious, but hopefully you can see like the question mark block is appearing as you see these images going through, right? Uh, what we can do then is we can compare against all of these potential frames, our actual frame. And we can say, oh, OK, so the closest one is actually this one right here. And then we can transcribe where Mario is in the potential frame onto the map in the required position. We do this a lot, and we end up with what we want, which is a player Mario moving through this map. Cool. So I think next we've got, all right, cool. So now we're going to start talking about some results. Yep. Um, I'm going to begin talking about a sort of comparative case study of some results, and then Adam will go into some more number crunchy things. Uh, so first of all, a quick player comparison. So this is a little bit tough to look at, so I'm just going to walk through it a little slowly. So this is another section of the same level that I've been using so far in the examples, level 1-1. One uh, this is what it looks like in the sort of representation that uh, the generator actually sees. And down here, we can see two different player paths. Um, this is, I think, video 1 and 3 or something like that. It doesn't really matter. It's just two different bit players playing through this level. The P, in this case, indicates places where the player is. And it's hopefully fairly obvious that these are quite different. If we look just right over here, we have this sort of massive jump 
that doesn't exist on this side. In general, this player on the right is looking to go as quickly as possible through the space. So they jump up onto this top section here, and then they run across really fast. They drop down below, get up as quickly as possible, and they jump up and around a whole bunch of enemies coming in to avoid them. Over here on the left, we see much more exploratory. They don't go nearly as high. They sort of stay low, jump all around, jump on everything. And the impact on this on the generator, once it's trained on both of these things, is we see things like this. Uh, so in particular, you can see uh, that this top one here was for the, the uh, first example, the one on the bottom left. You can see all kinds of like jumping it around, going all over the place, very sort of uh, uh, all clustered together. And this one below is an example of the levels generated from the player on the right. So you see these big jumps being sort of uh, the primary way that they're getting around, which is uh, what we saw before. So hopefully that is at least fairly interesting to look at. Adam will now talk about things that are even more interesting. <laughs> or less. Uh, so um, so uh, one thing we wanted to, to see is, uh, so there's a number of different metrics that people have uh, posted, you know, postulated as good things to look at for Mario. Uh, we, we look at a couple of these, uh, and this is sort of the, if you've ever seen like the classic generative space that uh, you know Jillian put out with uh, you know, linearity versus leniency, uh, this is a uh, triangle plot that explodes that out to a uh, for each pair of things we have you know empty, which then is unfortunately uh, maybe if you if you care more to dig into these uh, we can look at them on something that's not quite as washed out, uh, but you know we have the sort of histogram for that one so for each of them. And then, you know, the sort of 2D histogram of, you know, say this is empty, you know, as the x-axis and induced jumps as the y-axis. And what does the density look like in there? Um, so across all of these metrics, we wanted to see, uh, is our generator, you know, biasing the level of generation into different ways? And are they, you know, noticeably different from each other? Because they're all using the same course level geometry. Uh, but the player path, we would hope, would uh, or, you know, the goal was to see, is it actually going to change what it's generating? Um, so we wanted to compare against the original levels. Uh, you know, it's pretty sparse, but we sort of get an idea. Um, and so we found from this that the uh, SDP, uh, which is the uh, work from, uh, that I presented earlier, uh, had just about the best alignment with the original levels in terms of the space that it's generating. So we see here, uh, the nice plot. Um, I'm, they're a little bit better because uh, the original levels, there's about 40 or so, um, but the SDP, it's generated 4,000, so we wind up with you know, smoother uh, uh, contours, so it's what I'm going to be taking going forward. Uh, so here's the SDP, uh, and so we looked at four videos. Uh, one thing we could also consider was all four videos, you know, sort of averaging over players, uh, how does that do? And we see that the sort of Averaging over players gets to sort of the same level as the A star. Uh, it's a little bit different. We see that these like, negative spaces maybe shifted a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, uh, once we sort of start blurring over players, it sort of winds up being somewhere as like some sort of like uh, artificial player, uh, which is an interesting uh, and maybe speaks to future work that should be done to see uh, what this really means. Um, but we also had a what we would call like, the like, average player who sort of just went about the level, explored a little bit, didn't speed run it. Uh, and they had, again, a pretty similar uh, to the SDP approach. And so you can see the difference of the curves there. Uh, there was one, who, the video A uh, took every single time that they could teleport, uh, by which we mean they would go into a pipe, go to a bonus area, show up somewhere else, which you know, read on the original map as uh, teleportation, uh, again, was roughly, it was pretty close, although they wound up with, uh, I think, much more, or yeah, more linear levels uh, than less, because I think it also saw large stretches where they weren't there and just kind of was like, ah, oh, there's just nothing in between. Uh, but now we get to the really sort of different ones, uh, one of which was the speedrunner, uh, which we see really pushed the uh, like linearity way out and made them yeah, much, much more linear because it just sort of designed large, flat spaces for them to be running along. Um, and then the Explorer, which we see, uh, you know, really up the number, like the amount of decoration 
uh, decoration here was meaning that like tiles that were question mark blocks or enemies because they tried to interact with every single enemy, every single question mark block they saw. As it was generating their path, it also then generated more and more uh, things for them to interact with. And you know, here's the nice mass of all of them together, uh, which I will then, you know, you can see how the explorer really sort of stands out in some ways, and you know, the speedrunner stands out in others, like on the linearity and path distance. Uh, and then adding back in the originals. So uh, you know, this is wonderful graphical representation, but we also did statistics. Uh, and so we looked at a uh, Man Whitney test, uh, which would try it with looking at this uh, full sample space across these different uh, metrics would tell us which ones were significantly different, different from the others. And so for pretty much every single metric, uh, one of them was uh, significantly different. Uh, you know, D wound up being the most different from some of the others, and so did C. Uh, the originals, uh, you know, and it's hard to tell because the originals, there are so, few, so many fewer uh, than the others. So uh, it was statistically significant, but there's still the problem that it is they're much sparser. Uh, and while we didn't find that there was a single outlier for leniency, uh, we ran a crucible wallace test, which just says, is there any single one uh, that is better or significantly different? Uh, and it was found that there is uh, something, but it was un the man Whitney was unable to find which one population, just that these samples came from different populations. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we use long short-term memory recurrent neural networks to learn from player traces uh, derived from video. Uh, we, we did a process to extract player paths from video, uh, and then an experiment to determine whether place traces could bias the generator in uh, meaningful, interesting ways. Uh, we found that the A star is you know, sort of roughly analogous to the original le levels, and that by averaging over many players, we are also, again, roughly analogous to the A star. Uh, same with the average and minimally interacting players, and that the explorer tended to generate more interesting blocks and a longer required path, uh, and the speedrunner less interesting paths and flatter levels. So, take questions now. And oh yes, the pretty videos are from A, B, and C. So we see that A here, uh, it well thinks that they teleport from nothingness, but it does put them back here at the pipe, and you know does more teleportation and. I forget, B is the average one, average one. C is the speedrunner, right. and then D, D is the explorer. Right. Yeah. So, thank you. Any questions? So just a clarification question. I'm not sure how you operationalize meaning, like how meaningful Differences? Uh, what is SDP? I'm sorry. Uh, so SDP was the original uh, work of just the the A star uh, generator. Is the it's the SDP? So snaking and depth and path information is uh, so from the artificial, from player. artificial player is SDP. Right. So is how do you measure distance in those terms, I guess is what I'm trying to say. In what terms? So, so it's across each of these different uh, Across uh, these metrics. metrics. So for so for example, uh, for, uh, let's say, induced jumps, uh, the levels that were the original levels are significantly different on this specific metric than all the other levels. I see. On this specific metric of linearity, the levels generated from video A or significantly it's actually the opposite. Sorry, it's uh, opposite the college, the col no, it's that, uh, so for A, A is jumps. Play that, that's read, read going up, that that one is the different one. So for linearity, C was the significantly different one. And it's hard to see up there, but, or maybe it is like, so C, like, right, most of them have a curve looking like that, and C has the curve looking like that. So we, like, you know, visually we see C is very different, but also statistically, we see that it's okay. very different. So yeah, it's there's there's um, like or, or something different measure so like distance. D where D is like over here, and most of them are biased right there, or here where there's sort of a Gaussian right there, and D is right there. Again, I uh, can supply so slides to make it easier sure. since it's a little bit washed out. But um, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, I really like the working from video data stuff and there's video. Games. 
So suppose we want to do this for on GitHub. <coughs> Which parts, what, what uh, is the manual effort needed to do this again for uh, well, we would need to get the level data uh, in some sort of usable format, which I don't think we really have. You've done some looking at Sonic? Or no, 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 Mega Man, not Sonic. You've talked uh, about Sonic. I've talked about Sonic, but... So, so we need to get that. Uh, we would need to do the video extraction on it. Uh, the video extraction is mostly a autonomous, but there's some, like, okay, Here's the start of this level. Here's the end of this level. Like that was uh, manually done. Of like, start on this frame or start at like roughly this time stamp. End at roughly this time stamp. You're going to be searching through, you know, the annotated level that looks like yeah, that we referenced there. Um, you know, after that, it would be push the button, go. Uh, but so that would be the sort of the manual effort required. Yeah, a couple of. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, I think that's great, uh, great out, great out PM, specifically mm -hmm. out PM on the bread. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is uh, Google DeepMind uh, Pixel RNA. Yep, yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Aware of both of them, both of them came out after the original work on this and it was. Really? I'm, I'm pretty sure. I thought Grid LSTM was. At least, at least uh, I read it in November last year. Yeah, so this work was done in June of last year. Like the original using the LSTM uh, was done in June of last year, actually. So, yeah. Um, yes, I'm aware of both of those and would love to when I get the time to consider those. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about it. How am I supposed to tweet without my computer? Got a phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
or dynamic analysis. And we put these on two ends of an axis. We recognize that there can be sort of middling bits in between these two. But we identify static analysis as level analysis that relies on only structural features, so only features of the level, no notion of what these features are actually doing. In terms of dynamic analysis, we identify level analysis that tries to simulate out what a player is going to do in this level. So some notion of the player's behavior in this space. So there's been a, quite a few prior approaches for static analysis. Uh, we have patterns in game design, which look at sort of trying to clump together bits of structure and sort of what effects they might have on the player. You've got the computational metrics that we've mentioned just the last slide. Uh, we have uh, some individual work on trying to find like you know stealth uh, challenge and aesthetic things and whatnot. Um, you also have approaches to dynamic analysis. Uh, for example, here on the far left, uh, you have this sort of uh, attempt to have a, a race car game. So this is the track. This is a uh, little car moving around uh, to identify how a player might play through this. You have a couple platformers on the right where here you're trying to look at sort of what are paths that you can take through the level, um, or at a much higher level here on the right, sort of what sections of the level can you see and when. Now, the problem with these approaches so far is they tend to require a lot of hand authoring either in terms of the uh, sort of uh, features that you care about for modeling the player's behavior or back in static analysis. These tend to be uh, uh, hand-defined metrics or hand-defined sort of sets of features that we're interested in. And that's also a lot of effort. So could we restrict that even further? Ideally, what we're looking for here is something where we have some level representation, we pass it into a magical black box, and then out we get some prediction of user experience. Uh, and of course, uh, as Alex spoiled, uh, we've got some magic boxes on our hands, so we can see what we can do with those. The rest of this talk is going to look a little bit like this. We're going to take an initial look at the data set that we use for the work. We're going to talk about development and performance of our magical black box, uh, talk about problems with the current approach, and then talk about potential improvements in the future. So as is probably not a surprise, from the data set, we looked at using infinite Mario Brothers. Specifically, we looked at using a data set of 1,437 tag levels by race and all. Uh, these were tagged according to difficulty, aesthetics, and enjoyment on a nine-point Likert scale. Uh, each level was rated somewhere between one and eight individuals. Uh, so it is not an, it's not a perfect data set, but it is a pretty massive one. It's a good sort of starting point. Uh, one way that we can look at the data set just by itself is we can look at how individuals agree with each other. So we took a look at uh, what the correlation on the levels where they had exactly two ratings. And we found that people tended to agree to, with each other fairly well on difficulty ratings, um, OK on enjoyment ratings, and then not very well at all on aesthetic ratings, which is what you'd expect. And But these will also sort of color all of our results. Now on to our magic black box. Uh, I can lift the lid and we can look inside to find a convolutional neural net. Uh, this is a uh, deep neural net approach, uh, which has gotten a lot of success in the sort of image tagging, image understanding kind of sphere. Uh, the reasons we want to use it is we can input a map. So we can input essentially an image of the level, and we can output then a predicted value. Uh, which is, gets us pretty close to our desired goal here. The other cool thing about CNNs is we can automatically identify important features. So we can essentially query the CNN to figure out what features were uh, the things it was making decisions on. So that's very interesting in terms of automatically identifying like what are challenging features, what are aesthetic features, without having to have a human specify them beforehand. So without further ado, I'll actually go ahead and start presenting some results here. Um, this is with a very, well, not super simple, it's a three-layer CNN, uh, where we passed in a map level uh, representation that looks like this in the top left, got out a predicted rating, and this is sort of our performance here. Uh, the important thing to look at is that sort of R squared value there at the end, which tells us sort of uh, uh, how well do, we, do our results fit onto the correct answers here. Um, you can see that we do sort of moderately well on difficulty, and then sort of not very well at all on enjoyment or aesthetics. But we see that again, that sort of difficulty first, then enjoyment, then aesthetics. Uh, so these results aren't great. Um, so we'd like them to be a little better. One of the things we looked at was looking at adding some dynamic information. So 
particularly we had an A-Star simulated player. I can't show you a video of our A-Star simulated player because I ripped out all the visual bits of the engine in order to make it run faster. Um, but this one by uh, Robin Baumgartner is fairly close in terms of behavior to get you an idea. So you can see that we have essentially pixel perfect accuracy, plays through all levels really, really well, sort of very closely dodging enemies and destroying them as it needs to. Um, the features that we extracted from this A-Star simulated player were the number of states that it had to expand to get through a level versus the width of the level, sort of some notion of effort. The number of deaths to gaps, uh, and while it didn't die at all in the like, final playthrough, it does die during search. Uh, number of deaths to enemies, and the number of enemies that it had to kill in its final path. We include that as it's just trying, the Acer agent is trying to get to the end of the level as quickly as possible. So if it had to kill an enemy to do that, that implies that that enemy was important to finish, finishing the level quickly. So, ran the same CNN, uh, the, this time with these added features, and we can see that we did worse. Um, that's not great. Uh, we do a little bit worse on difficulty, uh, a little bit worse on enjoyment, much worse on aesthetics, about sort of half as well. Uh, so that's not good. Uh, so we then turned to sort of traditional uh, static analysis. So looked at some prior work, uh, and we grabbed five of the features that were used to not uh, to model uh, difficulty for in that prior work. We focused on difficulty again because we found that difficulty was the thing we'd expect to be able to uh, predict the best given sort of players agreement uh, with each other. The features we extracted here were the number of enemies in a level, the number of gaps, the number of power-ups, the number of cannons, and just the number of blocks. So again, uh, second verse, same as the first. Uh, we, can, we ran this through CNN, and again we did worse. Uh, only a little bit, though. We did, we did a little bit worse, uh, less worse on the difficulty this time. Uh, or maybe just one verse. Anyway, the idea is we did worse. So then we thought, uh, actually looking at sort of the individual teasing out predictions on individual levels, we found that between the traditional uh, features and the A-star features, there were actually individual levels that they did well on. So then we thought, what if we just combined all the features together? So we did a big hodgepodge of features here, total of nine, uh, the dynamic ones on the left, the static ones there on the right, and run those to the CNN. And the results are interesting. Uh, we did significantly better. Uh, a major leap, especially on difficulty, about 25%. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, and was not altogether expected. We also see that we got a major boost in enjoyment, um, and not a major boost in aesthetics, but given that our features are sort of designed towards difficulty, that's not a huge surprise. So that's interesting. Um, and on this sort of final CNN, uh, train CNN, we could then look at, for the, the difficulty, which we do the best at, we can then look at what were the learned features. So looking at the individual filters, what were the, the sort of pieces of level that maximally activated them, what sort of what were they making decisions off of? And we found that these things are things that look difficult. Uh, it's sort of the edges of gaps and enemies. Uh, I particularly like this one. Uh, in this one, you can see that if the player tried to like jump up, they'd actually like hit their head on the uh, the block here, and then end up getting hit by the goomba. So it's this this intelligent picking out of, of things that are tough. Uh, so that's that's very nice. It's good to see. On all, in this particular part of the work, we can say that we found a fairly accurate predictor of difficulty across different domains with minimal design features, so it's a total of nine. It's not too bad. Um, we saw a large improvement in predictive power when we had a simulated player plus some traditional metrics. Uh, teasing apart this a little bit more, we found that the major improvement here came from the A-star player's features and then the number of enemies in the level. Uh, CNNs aren't great at counting. And so it sort of makes sense that like, okay, so if the A-star agent had to like hit a number of enemies, but there were not that many enemies in the level, that means something different than the A-star agent had to hit a few enemies, but there are tons of enemies in the level. We have this problem though, in that our simulated player, our A-star agent, is not very human in terms of its performance. And I'll talk a little bit like about that right now. So let's look at a couple failures of our current uh, CNN framework. On the left, you see a couple levels that should have been rated as hard. These are rated as either eight or nine difficulty, but that our system rates as being medium. And on the right, you can see levels that should be rated as easy, but our uh, 
generator or our, our CNN rates as being medium as well. On here on the left, the reason why it's raised them as medium is because when the ace bar agent actually plays through this level, it's able to sort of like quickly jump in between, sort of dive between these enemies, never interacting with them. So it doesn't really matter that there's so many of them. Same thing with this one. The reason why this one is considered hard, or harder than it should be, is for a similar-ish reason. So if we look at this top one here, there's this nice like island of safety that a regular player could use to just avoid all of these enemies, but our Acer agent doesn't do that. That would take extra time to go out of your path. So it just sort of deftly dodges in between these enemies, which leads to an occasional death if it just like slightly goes off it during the sort of pathfinding process. So what we'd like is to be able to have a simulated player that acts more human. And our proposed solution to this is to use a little bit of uh, deep cue learning or deep reinforcement learning. Um, this is a uh, figure of just regular reinforcement learning, which I'll explain really briefly, and then I can explain sort of what's different about our proposed approach. So in regular reinforcement learning, you have some agent, say our Mario agent. The agent uh, knows what state it's currently in and uh, sends in an action to the environment that's meant to sort of change the current state. This action passes through a transition function, enters the environment, which changes the environment in the current state, and we get sent back a reward and a state back to the agent. Uh, there's some various different approaches to this, but the general idea is you want to maximize your expected future reward. Now, a, uh, in, for our A-star agent, our transition function was basically perfect, right? You could think of this, if you wanted to think of it in a similar framework, as the A-star agent was perfectly able to like take an action and then immediately get the result it wanted out of that, which is why you get this pixel-perfect play. So in changes here, we want to replace a deep neural net uh, in the agent section. So you can sort of better estimate or better generalize from one state into future states and hope to do sort of better play quickly uh, to maximize future rewards. We're also going to make another change to the transition function. But I'll get to that in just a sec. So the current state of the art in sort of deep cue learning is uh, uh, this double cue learning technique. There's a blog post, you can go read it on your, on your leisure. Um, and it plays basically optimally, uh, where it's sort of acting very similar to the A-star agent. It dodges things quite perfectly. It sort of hits just the edges, lips of objects so it can jump up higher from them, et cetera, et cetera. Except it also dies a lot, uh, which is not what you want. Uh, so, we're going to make a few proposed changes. Uh, these are just proposed, nothing definite right now. But what, one thing we'd like to do is we'd like to change our transition function. So we want a stochastic transition function based on things that are difficult for humans. So for example, timing of actions, like timings of jumps. So we want to make it so that if the agent wants to jump right now, it may not perfectly time it. It may do it a little bit early, might do it a little bit late. The other thing we want to add is a focus mechanism. And this focus mechanism will allow the agent to reduce this error, this chance of doing the wrong action, but at the cost of some negative reward. So essentially, it will, it will be difficult, more, more challenging, more taxing for it to, to sort of focus better so that it doesn't make as many mistakes. Um, we've done a little bit of tests on this initially, um, and we can see that on, for example, this example, for example, this example, uh, we're getting behavior which we think is a little bit more human. So, for example, on this level, our A-star agent does this thing where it jumps up onto the top of this, can this cannon, sort of jumps just enough to like get around some enemies, and then jumps just enough again to get around some more enemies, runs really fast, and gets out of there quickly. Whereas our uh, DQ agent, uh, because of this transition function where it can't be sure it will be able to do these position jumps, it tries to get to safety quickly. So it gets up onto this, this platform here, uh, where it's safer, gets up to this second platform, and then takes it to the goal flat that way. So we're not trying to argue that this is the human sort of way of playing this level, but it is certainly more human than this sort of superhuman A-star agent. So towards future work, uh, we would like to fully implement this human-like simulated player and test if it does, in fact, improve our system's predictions. We predict it would, but who knows. Uh, and we'd like to integrate our system's predictions into some kind of level recommendation or PCG-type systems, uh, potentially to be used by human designers so they can make levels faster. 
And that is it. I was a little bit fast, my apologies. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yes. Um, I do keep using DQ learning to develop a new application. It's a bit putting the target for the course. Um, so you, you have a forward one. So Q learning is strictly um, sort of the one you want to do. Um, if you're going to do reports, you should at least use uh, key learning, which assumes that you know the state positions, because you do. So, I mean, learning is to state positions all again, seems like unnecessary. Um, then, yeah, because key learning is basically is meant for when you don't have a, you don't have a problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, but here you have, that's what data storage introduces. Um, sure. So, so you could just use key learning that basically learns um, the state values rather than the actual values, which gives you more power and makes it easier. Um, uh, the other thing is that there are a bunch of like, more information like, that you can use here. So the uh, Mario and Turing test competition can have a bunch. Um, so Noor has like a number of them. Um, Juan Ortega, um, the paper about that is this kind of thing about like, Learning um, neural network based agents that would play more in the world of action. That's also available. Which, I mean, just to make it easier, you can sort of take that step. Um, yeah, also, right, so, okay. Right. Level, yeah. Level, yeah. 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 This is not the one when they start, this is the realm agent by Claire Hamlin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's also interestingly more human like than the ASR agent because it basically sets some goals, which they start to get some goals, but it sets some goals which are not just getting on the screen. Um, probably a good idea to do is just to use a whole portfolio of these different agents to characterize it using the, the relative performance of these agents. All right, uh, so, oh, that moves. Uh, so one of our sort of motivations, now that goes. One of our motivations was to try to do this with as little sort of human authoring as need be, uh, and to be able to do this in a way that would be cross-domain. So if we're using agents, uh, which have been previously created by other people for Infinite Mario Brothers, that means that, I, I don't know each of these agents individually, but they seem to require at least some level of domain-specific knowledge. Uh, and we'd like to avoid that if at all possible. So we certainly have access to this information. That's definitely correct. Uh, but we, we want to try to make this as domain-free as possible. Yeah. But will you, do you want to make it forward? Uh, possibly. It depends on, on sort of the places we'd like to, to go with this. I don't know if, Albert, if you wanted to respond to that at all. Yeah. So basically, so within the whole pandemic, um, so the one so uh, I don't I'm not sure if Albert remembers we did go over we did try a state model originally um, the problem is there are so many states in Mario uh, that we wanted to be able to try to uh, uh, have something that we could uh, generalize over states much more quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you need a state value approximator. It takes the same with purpose Q that we do. And the difference only is that you don't learn value of an action, you learn value of a state. So you have to learn less, basically. Anyway, we can take more of one. Sure. Adam. Um, did you do any, like, you showed the inter-rater reliability for humans. Yep. Did you do, you showed, you showed the error for the machine learning. Did you try to see what the inter-rater reliability between the machine learning was and the human? Like, the inter-rater reliability between, like, you uh, have the, the AI give a prediction. Now, what is the inter-rater reliability between that and, like, the, like, is it roughly analogous to another human? Because those inter-rater reliabilities Pretty low. Um, so the even the like poor performing AIs might have been 
roughly analogous to what a human is going to do. At least so we we didn't. Um, that would mean that we'd have to like slice up our data in slightly different ways to be able to sort of, I guess, mm -hmm. train and test on only the ones that had two. I'm not quite sure how you do it because so so we're training right on the ratings done by between one and eight people. So the idea that you'd have to sort of slice out some group of people that you don't train on and then test on them, I guess. Uh, I mean, you already, I guess you. Were, I mean, but you or you could pull down levels. And Sure. Unfortunately, we didn't have a notion of sort of, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there'd be ways to do it. Uh, we didn't look into it. We were more concerned about sort of the overall accuracy than how it compared to a, a single individual's ratings. And so, um, again, speaking to that, do you think that the data set, because the human iterator reliability was not that great, do you think that maybe, I don't know, that a, that it's just a hard problem if humans are bad at it, <laughs> how well will the machine do, and is that a problem with the data set, or is that a problem that is just uh, going to be a problem? Um, what are your thoughts? I have some thoughts. I'm trying to think about how I should respond in terms of NDA stuff as well. Uh, I don't, uh, so certainly this, this data set is not the best. Um, that's an issue. Uh, but these these techniques are general enough that you could use them with a variety of different data sources. Um, so you could imagine that you have not ratings necessarily, but maybe the time it took a player to play through a game, right? Um, that's a quantifiable thing. Uh, and you could make predictions on that instead. Uh, we chose ratings as it's sort of easily human understandable. It works for initial work. We had this data set to go off of. But there was a variety of different ways that you could extend this very easily to more quantifiable things that were less sort of wishy-washy. Yeah. So um, I like in your sort of next steps uh, thinking about human likeness as to do with like, bounded delays on sensing and actuation. Ah, yeah. Right? Like that there's something, um, there, there are, there are other ways to think about this problem of providing inputs to a game than like what do I do on every frame? Mm -hmm. right? um, I think it might be helpful to look at some of the literature on um, sample data control systems uh, or like controller synthesis as a problem, mm -hmm. um, cyber physical systems that may be really um, helpful in finding formalisms for these kinds of things. So um, you can see what other people have done in looking at both sides of the systems. Okay. Because, yeah, definitely people don't have, like, star expectations. <laughs> Not most people, yeah, certainly. Sure. Um, unless they're doing the, like, sort of frame frame full assistant speed up. Yeah, yeah, trying to do it without pressing A. Any other questions? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thank you all very much. Uh, so with that, we are uh, <laughs> wrapping up with our talks. That's the end of uh, XX Talks. Um, we'll be having a uh, coffee break after this until about 4 o'clock. Uh, when we come back, uh, we'll start doing demos. So if you have a demo you want to show, now's the time to sort of come up, get ready, be able to show it off afterward. Um, and also, if you gave a talk, uh, Kate Compton was very generous and made cake for everybody who talked. So <laughs> come get that before your coffee uh, quits. Great. <laughs>
on, right. unmute that microphone. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. We're doing stuff, people. Let's go. Demo. Great reaction to me standing. Um, uh, so we're going to start off with demos. The uh, general format we're going to follow is if you have demos you want to show off, uh, now's your opportunity. We're just going to kind of take free form, first come, first serve sort of approach. Uh, after that, we'll just break out and everybody can go sort of float around. So if you have a demo that really only works on your like machine, maybe just come in quick pidget so people know it's there. And after that, it's kind of float around the room, get to try out everybody's stuff chance to play around and enjoy it. Um, but otherwise, this is intended to be a chance to really showcase some of the cool stuff you're doing, get some people to come over, give you feedback, talk to them, sell them on it, and uh, keep moving forward. So uh, with that, do we have a first demo volunteer? Adam. How about during? No. <laughs> Oh, they have adapters here. Okay. Is there, do I use a microphone or anything? Or? Uh, you don't need to. Okay. The help pick it up is fine. Yeah, just talk sufficiently. Uh, I mean, you can use it. It makes you feel better. So I'm going to show you a, uh, you might call it a variation of Sudoku, but it's actually just normal Sudoku. Uh, hold on. You're not, the input is incorrect. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the stage where I'm trying to select input, so there it is. OK. Um, so we heard yesterday a little bit about the rules of Sudoku and how you might generate puzzles and so on. So this is, we assume that, that computers are capable of generating puzzles with unique solutions for Sudoku. Uh, but, but what can we do other than just make puzzles? Um, uh, this is a project that, sorry, after I did it, I have a story for, for why I did it uh, <laughs> in terms of using AI to breathe new life into pre-existing puzzles, so finding new depth in them. Uh, how many people are good enough at Sudoku to know about the X-Wing strategy and one, <laughs> one and a half uh, remote pairs and avoidable rectangles and intersection removal? So like, there's lots of things you can read about in these patterns of, uh, if this sub-piece of the puzzle is present, then you can definitely derive the location of this, this other one, and you can apply these strategies. Uh, without guessing to fill it in. So there's a whole lot of things you could study and get good at over time. And it's when I first learned Sudoku several years ago, and I saw these things, like, well, it's sort of, <clears throat> what's that? No, I was gonna say my life is a lie. <laughs> uh, uh, it sort of made me not want to do this. Like, I just want to have computers do the, the constraint solving. But I changed my mind about this after I made this thing here. So let me load an example level. Uh, and these are things just like the New York Times easy puzzles from the day I made this thing in January. Um, uh, if I click somewhere, it, well, it doesn't give me an option to enter in any details. The way you play this game is by sort of making an argument to the computer that cells must have a certain value, obviously. So pointing in this bottom, uh, in this cell here, uh, I think there's an eight there, but I don't just think that from guessing. It's like, well, I, I know it can't be in this row, or this column, or this column, because of this eight and this eight. It can't be in this row or this row because of that eight and that eight. Therefore, logically, this one must be the only place for the eight to go. And I click it, and the computer's mm -hmm. like, oh, yes, I'm unconvinced. I'll fill it in an eight for you. Um, and it's not like I've put in all of the 50 different strategies you can find on the Sudoku wikis. Uh, it just sort of looks at. The, the evidence you've given it and says, if the board contained just those things, uh, is the cell that you've pointed at uniquely, is there only one way to do it? If so, then there probably is some chain of reasoning, but neither of us are really going to figure out what that chain of reasoning is. So it sort of checks your argument without you knowing what it is, uh, which means you can do things like click every single cell and then click some spot, because that's certainly enough evidence to nail down one of those. Um, but you can also use a variation of this reasoning to say, as sort of a advanced Sudoku technique trainer uh, mode. Um, I don't know how to make a good GUI for it, but this says that uh, cell 8, 7, this is like 8, 7, this one, if I only clicked on these four things, those would be sufficient evidence for this thing. Uh, so I haven't surfaced the hint mode in the right way. But essentially, this thing can teach you new strategies, potentially even strategies that don't yet have a name, because uh, they might be specific to this board. Um, but that's because they involve a small number of clues, they are likely to, to apply to a lot of other ones. Um, 
one thing I want to do in the future is have a little hint in the corner that says the minimum size of evidence it would take to derive each cell there. And then it becomes a bit more like golf where uh, you're trying to get the lowest score possible by, by making the most concise arguments. And it says, well, you could make an argument of, you know, of only cost four for the cell, but I'm not going to tell you what that argument it is. So you're still playing Sudoku, but you're, you're being much more explicit about your thinking. So you could play uh, the days, easy, medium, hard puzzles from New York Times and so on, but have a much deeper experience than the person who's just doing it uh, on paper. Uh, and because this is a talk from me, Adam Smith, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that this is uh, based on answer set programming. <laughs> and if you want to know about what does it take to, uh, uh, come on, thingy. What does it take to um, solve a puzzle? It's these five lines. But look, it's inside of a script tag. So yes, you can use answer set program in the browser. There's no server component to this. It's all just in the web page. Uh, so it'll work on your iPhone and so on. Um, so that's uh, Cryptoku. <laughs> any, any questions about that? Or you can talk, ask me more later. So I, I assume that I can't just give it a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, pieces of an argument uh, and then it give sort of the wrong answer to that argument. It, it has to be still consistent with the rules of Sudoku. If, if, as long as you pick things that are on the board, all those are, they're all subsets of valid arguments. You can't make a... You, know, you can make an incomplete one where there's insufficient evidence. Right. Uh, one thing I've been shown is that if you wanted to, if you could show you the counter example would be like, if, it, if the board consisted of only mm -hmm. those things you picked, mm -hmm. here are two consistent ways for it to be filled in. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of like, it's, it's arguing back with you and I just have it like, not accept it and it's like try again instead of like, let's talk about how precisely we were going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So if you had a row that just had one square empty, you have to click on all of them. That would be and one then, argument of cost eight. But there might be a uh, so uh, way of doing it with fewer. So, yes, you could click the, the seven above and then the eight to fill in that one. That would be one way. But likely in a real world, there are other things around, and they're often like uh, size eight is a relatively, I'd say, like a heavyweight argument. Um, but it's usually an easier one. So if you were playing, so like I was trying to get the, the, the least score, um, you could do that, but there might be better ones. Right, but I mean, from my perspective, it's not like eight pieces of evidence. Like it's immediately obvious that like it's kind of like the inverse, right? There's only one thing left. Like I, I don't know. If you had an auto fill, once you get seven in a row, just to say, or eight in a row. Oh, uh, uh, one way if you wanted to use this to sort of train the advanced strategies was if there is an instance of one of those easy strategies, always fill all those in for you. So it basically just shows you the highlights of the extreme hard points. Um, so you can do things like down some of the down with these extreme difficulty puzzles, and let this walk you through the hardest parts, but then have fun filling in all the, the easy steps in between. But you get to those, and you're like, I have no idea how to proceed. And it's like, well, because of this precise configuration of 13 things at a time, which maybe isn't even a pattern that, that has a name yet. Uh, that 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 would be so hard. You're welcome to see that. Whoever is next for a demo. Who's next? next the podium. All right. All right. So this is for Duke Joint. We have a demo of it. Um, so there's already a talk. So there's not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going back over it. But this is what it looks like if everyone wants to come and check it out. Oh, wait. Is it OK to use the HDMI cable? Uh, you can use HDMI cable, you're just going to have to hit input several times on uh, Okay. Two more times. You did it. Awesome. Okay, cool. So this is what Juke, Juke Joint will look like when you come over to play it if you want to. I don't know where we're going to set up the computers, but hopefully we'll have somewhere where you can play it on this computer. Hopefully one day it will be a fully fledged web app. Um, that will have a bunch more awesome stuff connected to it once it's fully built. Uh, but you kind of just go through and you'll uh, get to see uh, the bar that you're going to enter. It's all procedurally generated. Um, 
and you get to meet some of the, your cast in the haunted jukebox and get to see the the surface of what of what the game produces. Uh, there's not right now a lot of insight into all of the AI stuff that we talk about in the paper, uh, but it will be cool, I think, for you all to have, like know what's going on in the background and then compare that with what's being shown. Uh, we get a lot of like inspiration for how we can like bring some of that like all of that deep computation that's happening to the surface. And so hopefully we can start some conversations about that. Um, but yeah, so this will be here. You already, you know about Duke Joint, we already talked about it, so. Next. You have, okay, am I shooting the video? Uh, oh, yeah. I'd like Are you shooting the video? I can. Okay. Go uh, well, so I'm streaming right now. So just oh, take oh, some more yeah, effort. Like I'll do it. What are you doing? We have the technology. We have some technology. <laughs> the technology. I didn't think we'd show the video. I thought you pulled up. Yeah. Sorry, the internet decided that uh, I need to refresh my connection, and now I have to go back and connect to Hilton Honors. Do a race. Let's see how fast I can get my Cux thing going up on this thing. I think I'm going to win. But uh, no. Okay. Yeah, you probably will because I don't even have like a window open. We're also competing against a very slow computer, so who knows? I got it. All right, thanks. Next question, where's the input button? Great. Bingo. I'm going to present a uh, robotic mic cook. You mean mic cook? the player the very bare minimum. So it teaches them the mechanics, but it doesn't really teach them um, a lot of what the things in the world do. Um, so it starts out by teaching them to move. Moving uses the arrow keys. Um, then it teaches you to use the taser. So if you hold down Z, um, you'll hear a buzzing noise, um, and that means you're sort of charging your taser. And when you run into someone, you'll zap them like this. Um, then it teaches you hacking. So hacking is the main part of the game. I'm actually going to talk about it more in depth when I play the main game in about a minute. Um, but uh, we basically teach them hacking by telling them to press tab to open hacking. Um, and then a, a word will come up next to the terminal. Um, in this case, it's P, um, it's like an initial and then a last name. Uh, they can type it in, press enter to hack it. Um, so the message will tell them to exit hacking. And then when they touch the terminal, they'll steal some data and they get another message. Um, the second to last thing it teaches them is about security doors. So this is the only badly designed, well, it's not the only, this is the worst designed part of the tutorial. Um, 
So this terminal in front of them is a security terminal. It gives them a key card that they can get through this door with. Um, but when they when they dismiss this message, they, there's nothing really to tell them what to do. So this door is locked and they can't get through it. Um, but if they hack this terminal, they will gain um, a plus one key card. And you can actually see their key card up in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Now let's get through the door. And then the last thing they do is hack this window and jump through it. And that's the tutorial. So the tutorial is pretty short. Um, you don't have to get them to test it if they want. If you prefer, so you can explain it to them. So they, they might already know from watching people play and um, standing behind them and stuff. So, the main game. Um, for this build, it's a game. I've broken the main game apart and I've given them just a single block of uh, the city to run around. So when they press the new game at the main menu, they're going to start by flying in on this taxi that you can see here. Um, and an objectives window will pop up on the left hand side. I'm going to write a little page explaining how the objectives work and what to do in the game. Um, so if you want, you can like print it out and have it next to the machine. Um, but the objectives are always there if they want to try and explain to them how, how, what they've got to do. So they can press escape code and close it. Um, before we talk about the objectives, let me just tell you a bit about the UI. So in the top left, you can see there's things like your security level, which is key card, and how many terminals you've hacked in the middle with the red number, and then your current shield level, which is kind of like your health. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that because people will probably die. Yeah. They won't know necessarily how much or why they died. That's OK. Um, it's not something I've worked on yet. In the top right-hand corner is the building. And the building owner, so this building is owned by North African Finance, um, and their slogan is uh, In Search of Growth. And finally, the status of the building. So in this building, we haven't been set detected yet, so the, the text is green, and we're safe. Um, <laughs> let's talk about objectives in a minute. Uh, so these are doors, which you can go up and down. Um, so once I go underneath, it's gone. And um, I can press down to walk uh, down, and press left and right to move to right. Uh, these are the windows that we saw in the tutorial, so if I hack this one, I can jump through it fast. Um, scattered around these buildings are terminals like this one. Um, and just like in the tutorial, we can hack them, and we can see the, the red number at the top left has gone up because we hacked an extra terminal. Um, hacking terminals uh, currently doesn't really get you much because there's an, you're only in one city block, uh, but the uses of it will be a bit later on in the game. Um, but you can encourage people to do it. I think effectively the objective of, of this little demo is to hack as many of them as you can and escape alive. So that's kind of like the score if you want to. You can write down like whoever gets the highest uh, number of hacked down, I guess. Um, these little red dudes are low security guards. Um, so if they see you, they will go like that. And they'll have an extra question mark above their head. Um, like they're going to completely screw now and so it's good. Um, so basically, when they see you, they will first open fire on you, like this. There we go. Um, then, if they lose sight of you, they have a call in an alarm. And um, once the alarm goes through, uh, you will see, well, I'll show you what happens. Um, some very scary people drop down into the building. You can see them at the top here. Um, dressed in white, and they have much more powerful guns. Um, and they will come looking for you, so that's not really, uh, very dangerous. Um, so, in general, people want to avoid these guards. If they get into the building, you can encourage them to sort of run away from them. Uh, now that we've screwed that building up, we'll enter this one to show you the next building. So, the objective in each of these buildings is actually to um, find a security. Uh, um, <laughs> to find a security uh, terminal um, to raise your key card level. Um, because in order to reach the exit, you need a uh, key card level of three. Um, so that must be for the last night to get a guess. Let's go up here and look around. Um, the buildings are not laid out like regular buildings, as you can tell. Um, so sometimes it might take a bit of exploration to find out where you want to go. So I'm actually going to risk it and go back into this original building in order to uh, find out where to go next. Uh, just wait for the guard to get past us. Okay, there's the security uh, terminal. You might remember that from the uh, tutorial. Um, so we're going to hack that. We're going to wait for this guard to go past us. And I'm going to grab it. Um, you can see our security guard is not going to have to 
trying to put together for this time, what the information they should do, and they need to find one in each building. So there's three buildings, and they need to find uh, the security terminal in each one. And we'll go looking for this one now because we've uh, okay, so we can hack that one. Uh, now we can go on to the third and final building. Obviously, I'm uh, rushing through a lot of the stuff because I don't want this video to take too long, but normally people would go hunting for extra terminals or uh, extra uh, goodies. So, in this third building, we need to find one more security terminal to get our pass up to level three, and then we need to find the uh, final. Uh, we need to find the, the other way to access power. That's our security panel. So, so the only difference is that once you have get you'll see in the top right hand corner there's no countdown for this list arrival. Um, now. Uh, Okay, I think I managed to avoid them. Um, so when this countdown reaches zero, what you see is on the top of the building, on the right hand side, a lift will appear. There we go. And when I hit the lift, I get in, press down to get out. So that is basically, that's what you have to do in this time if you want to finish it. I imagine most people will not finish it. Yeah. And uh, that's Robotic Mike Cook with his game of road process. <laughs> <laughs> That's my problem with it too, actually. I will never create a game on that They're already running on a computer, so you play it. This is Hamlet. Uh, well, Grandma Day is saying Hamlet. It's called Elsinore. And it is, you're playing Ophelia, stuck playing Hamlet over and over and over and over again, trying to make it less crappy than it is. It's just hard. Is it, you know, if, if, you, if you do absolutely nothing, then the events of the original play will play themselves out. But. It should be. Never mind, you're fine. You good? Okay. Get your space wells. This is from Absley, by the way, which is awesome. Yes. If you haven't played it. Sorry, our, our sound our sound designer worked on that game, so we're a little bit pressure. Um I guess there's like okay, there's two parts on We'll talk about like what, what the game is really fast, and I'll talk about like sort of like why is it at an AI conference and what the AI is doing, but uh what's gonna load so you can actually see it. So let's just hear it. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. This is like in the middle of it, so you don't get to see the beginning. Um, so we're, we're skipping a huge introduction section and a tutorial and some other stuff. Um, but as Eric mentioned, you play as Ophelia. Um, we start in the scene where Hamlet is bursting into her bedroom somewhere around Act 2. Um, and you only hear about this through a conversation during the actual play. But So Hamlet is mad. He screams a lot. I'm going to skip over a lot of the dialogue because that's not sort of the important part here. So um, one of the main mechanics in this game is the use of information. So as Ophelia, you're a character with very little agency in the original play. But as you go through the game, you acquire information that you can use to try and influence other characters and how they behave. So sort of, you know, Hamlet came into my room. You know, he said something kind of crazy. Um, so like, so for example, you know, here I, you know, Hamlet is acting very strange. And so, you know, I can sort of, I can walk around. This is a 3D environment with the castle. I'm immediately assaulted by my father Polonius as I leave the bedroom. And this is actually a weird touching scene because we jumped in the middle. So it's Groundhog Day. She's in loop two, loop one. It played the play. Her father died. And now, she's, now she's like her father's not dead. So Ophelia is <laughs> having a bit of a moment. Oh no, spoilers! You uh, everyone dies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just saying like it's information manipulation. So un un like, like it's a bit narrative. Simulation essentially, like this, it was like with like hand authored scenes, but then like how the characters are being controlled is through a giant like AI -ish simulation. 
Um, unlike other ones, they're not individual agents. The game state does kind of represent their individual thoughts. So we track like what Hamlet knows and what Hamlet wants to do right now to probably get revenge on his uncle and or everybody else in this castle. So and for example, at the moment. Um, I can talk to my dad, and I will tell him that Hamlet was acting strangely, and he will be we'll have this nice charming conversation, and he's like, oh, well, that's really strange. You should go follow him. Um, change what thought? No. Sometimes when you change what thought, it'll like change what they think. But these are not like we're not simulating these as like individual ages in the sense that there's some sort of uh, like uh, mental simulation of what they do. Instead, it's more of like a giant holistic scheduler, where basically it's the game is a big scheduling problem where the game is trying to plot down events that all the other NPCs go to, and for the player to watch that are determined by what all of the NPCs are thinking at the moment. So that's kind of like the, the, the core structure of it. So, like a giant so for example, um, this is a full 3D, this is a map of the castle, so there's different floors there's of the castle. Of yeah, and I'm going to quickly auto path to an event in the gardens right now. Where Horatio's chatting up your truth. Yes, Horatio, Hamlet's friend, was chatting up. Oh, never mind, he's left. And <laughs> they just left. So we're a little bit slow on that. Oops. Um, so instead, what we will do is I will run to everyone is busy, it's the morning. Um, I'm going to quickly run over to the Great Hall where court is being held. And I think this is where Claudius is going to tell Rosen Francis and Gilden Sir to spy. Yes. Constantly. So I will enter this scene that will play out. So despite the fact that Ophelia is standing there, she's basically invisible to everyone because in the play she's basically invisible to everyone. Um, <laughs> so so Claudius is going to inform Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that he wants them to spy on Yeah, so we picked up more information. So, now we can rat out them on Hamlet, for example, and I don't know what Hamlet does. Probably nothing nice about yeah. it. But the other thing that's happening is that um, there's a there's sort of there's a there's a mental model that all the characters are keeping. So they can believe information, and then they can like also also know things or like. And this this is represented as a very simple predicate logic. But for example, we now Rosencrantz now wants to investigate Hamlet, and so if we want, we can quickly try and piece out, and I can try and. Go find. Probably brooding his room. Yes. Oh, he's probably that's. Oh no, he's in the courtyard somewhere. Oh, this is brooding his room. Yeah, he's brooding the courtyard. I don't know. The courtyard is awfully big, so it's kind of hard to find. Um, him. Oh, there no. he is. I guess I'll this is this is like a development thing. So you get to play it afterwards on these computers. The other thing I want to mention is is sort of more aspirational AI aspect of this. As somebody who makes design tools. This is where I was like, it'd be really cool if we could apply some of the stuff we're doing to a larger scale commercial game that we're making with. Um, it's not just us. There's like a lot of people. I obviously did not draw all of this for this writing. Um, there's a lot of people in this project. So we were hoping to do some amount of like automated play testing or model checking to try to help out the designers in terms of catching problems with their design or helping them to understand things they've written. And Turns out making games is really hard, and so we're just struggling with this. So I'm really excited to have any conversations. Anybody has any like, ideas or interesting things? That's, that's yeah. we still have this. So we have still some time before we ship this, but I, and I hope to see you. And yeah, and so there's a lot going on around the castle. So this is just a very small snippet of all the events that are going on at any given point in time. So all the ones in black are the ones that I've actually been around at or when I told people about particular pieces of information. Other things will appear here, like events that might happen in the future. Um, and it's sort of Eric was mentioning, and mentioning this thing with the scheduler, so this will sort of start to fill up as we start piecing to get like giving people the right pieces of information and sort of talking to the right people. And then there's this whole aspect of the time loop where you know multiple loops, you know, you'll get information in one loop and then you'll sort of carry it on to different loops and then use this to influence things and shortcut your way to getting further on in the story later. So yeah. Um, we'd love to have people check it out if you're curious or just you know chat with us about any interesting ideas you might have about narrative and stuff.
so you already know about the project because hopefully a lot of you are here for the talk. We're doing um, mixed reality lemmings and mixed reality Mario. And since we don't have a mixed reality device right now, you can either try playing the game out on the computer or in Oculus <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we are beating the system because so far I keep dying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so basically you start out somewhere in the room, you can basically pick a starting point of where you want to, I guess, be standing when the level is generated. So once we do that, <coughs> we, uh, so it'll take a few seconds. All right. So we have this little portal here. We have the one swanning as shown in the video before. We attempt to get them to the goal, which is over there. <clears throat> yeah. We place the direction box in the jump pad just like we started the demo. Let's see if that actually works. And that did not work. All right. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. <laughs> yep. So yeah, if anyone wants to come try it, you can try it and on the Oculus on computer. Mm -hmm. Just right here. Um, it's not really worth me standing up for, but enough people have asked to see my game, I'm going to do a quick demo of it. Um, so if you want to have a go and call me out many people like Sandra, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think, is that everybody? Everybody good? I, I have a sort of quasi demo slash quasi announcement, yeah. which is that uh, at the bar last night I was talking to some people about role playing poems, which are 15 minute three quarter area uh, RPGs, and there was an interest in maybe some tonight, so if you're interested in playing short little art RPGs, all right, thanks guys, um, thanks all for coming to XEG. Um, uh, this ends the like formal part of everything. At this point, you're free to kind of roam around, show off your demos, see other people's stuff, get a chance to talk and mingle. But the actual like official XEG events are wrapping up at this point. Um, we definitely would love to hear your feedback. So please like email us, let us know what are things that you like, things you didn't like, uh, issues you had, new things you think we should be thinking about or doing. Feel free to come talk to me. I hated it. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> the whole thing. Keep streaming, damn it. Um, anything and everything. Um, last year we did an open panel to get some feedback that worked a little bit, but it seemed like we kind of got the same response. So I think at this point we want to really just have you feel free, come let us know what works, what doesn't. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and with that, I think that's a wrap. So thanks, guys.